Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. Uh, I'm going to hop over to this slide and uh, just share a little bit of context about uh, this work during these very tricky, complicated times that we're engaging with. Um, a little bit more background about myself. How did I get into doing this compassion work? I was actually interested in something that seemingly is the perhaps opposite of this, which is the cycle of violence, trauma, and aggression, trying to figure out why is it that hurt people hurt people, working with uh, trauma professionals, international trauma experts like Dr. Ronnie Berger and social psychologists like Dr. Phil Zimbardo, really trying to understand these dynamics of, of, of malevolence, hurt, and aggression, and why is it that we other people, why is it that we push people into groups that are seemingly different from us, leading to prejudice and hatred of the other. And the more we did that kind of work, the more it seemed like compassion is a powerful antidote in terms of how to respond to these types of realities. What is more, these types of sufferings, we see that what truly supports and helps us is the cultivation of communities of care. And here we are facing a different type of complexity, a different type of war, some might say, as I will be arguing later today. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're needing support, we're needing connection, we're needing solidarity, we're needing the capacity to cultivate these communities of care. And at Palo Alto University, for the Compassion Training Institute, we are striving to offer up avenues, pathways, and opportunities to consider how to work with our own minds, as well as consider how to find ways to connect with others and to cultivate communities of care at these complicated times. So I'm going to kind of jump in a little bit and offer up a bit more context on the kind of work we'll be offering. And the core model that we'll be operating off is compassion-focused therapy, or really what we're doing here is referred to as compassionate mind training that was developed by Professor Paul Gilbert. He's a very generous man, by the way. So you see these links at the bottom there. You can find lots and lots of resources. Uh, I'll share a little bit of context about Paul's life and career trajectories because I think it really helps narrate the model that we're going to be learning about together and how we're going to be relating it with what is happening now with this pandemic, with COVID. Um, Paul started out looking at the neurobiology of depression and really the neurobiology of suffering going on to specialize in Jungian therapies and attachment-based uh, perspectives and, and really deepening into those dynamics of, of, of being a mammal and those powerful archetypal forces that operate within us, going on to specialize in uh, cognitive behavioral therapies. He was actually the president of the British CBT Association in the early 2000s. Uh, integrating a lot of mindfulness-based perspectives, somatic types of therapies, and if you were to ask him, none of these are his main focus, but rather it's the evolutionary perspective. How we came to be as a species and what is it that we would be needing in order to be able to feel safe and connected together. Uh, he's recently offered a, a brilliant series of talks. So far, there's 12 of them up on the website. You can see it at the bottom here, compassionatewellbeing.com. Uh, those are free talks, and they're also available through our resource website at Palo Alto University. So if you're finding any of this interesting, there are opportunities to delve much more deeply into it. Another thing I want to say about comments, there's so many of us uh, on the line today. I think more than a thousand people signed up, so lots of people on the line. Um, and I wouldn't be able to respond to all of them, but I want to encourage you to Post comments and questions the best you can. I'd love to learn from you. Uh, even if we wouldn't be able to respond to all of them, we would be thrilled to, to read those afterwards and learn from your impressions. So, so let's kind of dive in and see what's happening here with this compassion work that we speak of. Well, what, what, why do we need it? Well, the first suggestion is that, that life is hard. These are rough times, and this guy is actually doing some things that are perhaps uh, luxurious these days, being outdoors and so forth. If we're looking at our realities, uh, it's, it's far from simple. Some of us are stuck, isolated at home, trying to figure it out. There's a small minority of us, sadly, that are actually sick and, and even fighting for our lives. Some people have lost their lives. And again, we have our healthcare workers, our frontline warriors, if you will, soldiers of compassion, the troops, as we will call them later. They're really taking a lot of uh, 
of stress and dealing with a lot of threat, trying to help keep us, keep us all safe. So we start by acknowledging that these are really complicated times. These are times of challenge. These are times of darkness. Yesterday, I was reflecting on the best way to begin this presentation that I hope will not just be intellectual, but also reach something at, at, at our somatic experience, reach our hearts as well. Um, I don't find sugarcoating to be helpful usually. We do believe in soothing and care and nurturance and plenty of that will, will happen as we unfold together. Uh, but really want to acknowledge what is present for many, many people. And some of you have already begun sending in questions and comments. And I'm going to read one of them. I'm going to do it anonymously, of course, to honor the person that sent it. Um, I'm reading it because it struck a chord and I think that it resonates with many of us these days. While I've been managing okay with the emotions coming and going as the weeks of lockdown drag on, I sometimes find myself in a spike of anxiety. It sometimes happens when I'm going to bed or if I wake up in the middle of the night, my heart might race and I feel tension in my chest. My mind is usually also racing or fixated on fears. How can I help ease myself out of those situations? Wow. You know, I share this one because I believe that most, if not all of us, have had a taste of that type of an experience. Many of us on, 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 on the line here, I imagine, are working as therapists. Some of us are just individuals wanting to learn about some perspectives and capacities for coping. And these are, these are real experiences that, that we're all dealing with. And the beginning of the response to this really profound sharing the words, how can I ease myself out of these situations? I want to acknowledge and validate that it, that is the intuitive human response, reaction really, I want out of this. I don't want to feel this. So the intention here, how did I not experience this? And one of the things I will be suggesting is how can I gently ease myself into that experience in order to meet it with care and nurturance? I'm going to share a quote in a moment, a wisdom quote that was very personally meaningful to me. A few years ago, I was dealing with a lot of uh, physical, medical suffering. There was emotional pain as well. It was a very dark and challenging time. And I came across a wisdom quote that really agitated me, even angered me. I was quite upset when I saw it. It was this zinger moment. It was very simple and very profound. And the more I allowed myself to be with that wisdom quote, the more I was able to relax and benefit from it. And I will share it with you here. When you learn how to suffer, you suffer much less by the famous Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh. And I remember coming across this wisdom quote, thinking to myself, well, I don't want to learn how to suffer. That, that is not on the menu. I am not willing. I reject the idea of learning how to suffer because I do not accept that I got to deal with this pain. I don't accept that I got to be stuck in my house, feeling that the threat and suffering in the world is unacceptable to me that I need to learn how to suffer. Well, I did that for a while and guess what? I suffered more. So this is this fundamental acknowledgement that when suffering comes to visit, when challenge kind of knocks at our door, we can run away from it. It's only going to grow. When we're able to regulate ourselves, slow down, beginning to allow ourselves some peacefulness and spaciousness within our physical body, we begin to recognize the roots and causes of this suffering, how it's unfolding, and we find some relaxation in that space. And indeed, we suffer much less. Sometimes we even experience joy. So on some level, not to be a total bummer here starting the presentation like this, we're going to talk about learning how to suffer and how to be in relationship with our suffering in a way that's more productive, more helpful to us and those around us. And if we in, a, approach it from this perspective of compassion mind training, we start by talking about this evolutionary nature of our mind. Recognize here that the human brain is really the, 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 an amalgamation of lots and lots of evolutionary processes that our species has dealt with over the course of many, many, many years. So it's really a work of 
tapestry. We didn't get a ready-made brain that was prepared just for us. We share lots and lots of competencies with other species. So this is something we begin to acknowledge that our brains in a way are quite tricky. There's a challenge built in to our setup here. So we talk about this as the tricky brain functioning, this interaction of all the new psychologies, trying to understand our old brain dynamics and our new brain dynamics. So we start by talking about our old brain. These, these motives, you know, getting enough food, relationship seeking, caring, status, power, these powerful threat emotions. Um, we think about this, this trajectory of the reptilian types of functioning and then the mammalian types of functioning. I'm not endorsing what we call the triune brain, this notion that we have a clear geographical location of these brain structures within us like the other species, but we do share competencies. So for instance, when we think about the reptiles, there's this kind of funny way of saying it. People talk about the five Fs, feeding, fight, flight, freeze, and romance, right? So we share these competencies with other uh, species, in this case, reptiles, we want the same things. We're really eager to survive. And our, our survival mechanisms are probably the most powerful within us. We're going to get into that together in various variety of ways. And recognize that these old brain types of functioning really interact with our new brain types of functioning, the way that our thoughts are operating. So our ability to imagine, to plan ahead, ruminate, mentalize, kind of being in the minds of others, imagine things. These are things that are probably unique to our species. And we feel the threat and suffering of the world. That is what is happening with our threat mind. Even those of us who are safe these days are able to even be employed, which is not a small thing. We're, we're safe in our homes. Uh, we feel the suffering of the world. We feel the distress. We begin to grieve for those that have not yet died. Our thoughts are kind of spiraling out of control. When I think about my clients in private practice or my students who are working with clients out in the community, people are really flying forward with their mind, you know, thinking about all the things that are going to go wrong in a month or two or three because their threat system is so active. So we begin to invite people to notice that programming, notice that it's really the desire to feel safe, that it's coming out of our old brain trying to keep you safe, and it actually creates the opposite effect. It makes you feel more unsafe. Respond to it with what we call the mindful brain. This ability to learn more and more about our programs, the way that our programs actually work and operate, leading to self-criticism, social comparison, feeling like we're nobody, feeling like we're not enough, we're not doing enough during this time. We'll get more into it together. So in the one hand, there's, there's this idea of feeling unsafe because of our threat system being so active, and then these, these painful anxieties that keep us up at night about our own experience. There's something more that happens that's really worth acknowledging. We also begin to other different groups that are not seemingly our own. That is also something that comes out of our threat brain. It's really interesting. Our mammalian modes of functioning, being a mammal has to do with caring and nurturing our young, being with those who we feel affiliated with, whether our offsprings, people in our lives, so we feel a connection there. It's also the seed of prejudice and racism and othering. We begin to see other people as different from us because that's a way to make us feel safe. So that which makes us mammals and care for our own also leads us to push away those who are seemingly different from us. And we're gonna get into that together. We're gonna be curious, can we see that virus is different from us and the entire human race as one race in solidarity? That's something we're gonna dive into together. We wanna to respond to all of that with a sense of compassion, a sense of understanding towards these tricky brain dynamics, the, these ancient programs that are keeping us rooted in a place of threat and beginning to find safeness in those circumstances. One of the core messages coming out of compassion mind training is the following. It's not your fault, but it's your responsibility. Meaning it's not your fault. You're in this really tricky, painful place. It's not your fault. You're suffering in these very complicated ways. You didn't choose to do this. You didn't design your brain to be so threat sensitive, to have a better safe than sorry mentality. We're always scanning and searching for the negatives. Rick Hansen talks about our mind being like Velcro for the negatives and Teflon for the positives, right? It's not your fault your brain operates in this way, but it is your responsibility to respond productively. 
Why does that look like? From our perspective, the responsibility is to be able to respond with a sense of compassion to these realities. We define it as a sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a deep motivation to alleviate and prevent this suffering. So we're in contact with our own suffering. We're in contact with other people's suffering and we are responsive. We want to have an ability to be motivated to do something about that suffering, to take care of others, to take care of ourselves to the extent that we can without overwhelming ourselves, of course. We'll get into that too. We talk about two psychologies, one moving towards suffering that has to do with mindfulness, with recognizing what's happening, has to do with distress tolerance. And when we begin to understand the root of the problem, we begin to understand what is happening there with my particular scope of challenge, pain, struggle, and so forth. Then we move forward to taking action to actually alleviate suffering. Find out what action is needed before you do anything about your challenge. Oftentimes we put in lots of effort, it's not the needed effort, right? So we're gonna build on these definitions, being in relationship with suffering, responsive to it. Let's see what unfolds next. Why compassion? Why am I even talking about this? Well, turns out it's good for you. It's correlated with lots of improvements in the immune system, physical well-being, psychological functioning. And we're gonna dive more into that together. We're gonna look at a little bit more data together. But the notion that being in relationship with suffering is Look, no matter what you do, you got to be in a relationship with suffering. If you run away from it, you got suffering chasing you. If you approach it with care and groundedness, you have a much better shot at suffering less. So when we build on this understanding on compassion, we can think of it as, as, as a sense of flow. It's an opportunity for me to also share a, a, a personal set of impressions. You know, when I was finishing up grad school, I guess more than 10 years ago by now, I'm, I'm becoming slightly less young. Um, my understanding about psychotherapy work and healing and, and helpful psychology work as a whole was that people need a hug. I was thinking that people need to be able to extend a hug to others, to receive a hug from others and show themselves a hug. And I kept it to myself because it didn't sound scientific enough. And how delighted was I to come across the work of Paul Gilbert and looking at this compassion focused therapy model, it turns out there's a lot of data. So when we talk about compassion, it's really about the ability to extend care and helpfulness to others, to receive care from others, and then to show it to ourselves. It's always about the relationship with these three. You know, a little while ago, I was, I was meeting with a mentor of mine through the Zoom, and he was asking me, what, what, what do you feel like you need from me at this time? And I told him, I think I need a hug. And he smiled and he said, that would be nice. It would be even nicer if you're able to offer yourself a hug. So that was a little bit of an aha moment, even for me, I'm in this stuff all the time. And yet we tap into these fundamental needs and the recognition to be able to offer ourselves a hug, that's the beginning of responding to some of these questions, how do I take care of myself? It has to do with being in relationship with the other three, why the two dimensions, extending and receiving. And also this notion of social solidarity, the ability to be in contact with ourselves as well as with others, the ability to believe that we are in a place of belonging with others, the ability to experience ourselves as belonging to a community of care that is so important. I wanna tell you about the work of my beloved friend, Professor Jamil Zaki out of Stanford University. He's a pro-social neuroscientist. It's a book that came out last year, a really wonderful book that really unpacks some of these issues some more, talks about the need for care and nurturance, the benefits of empathy, as well as the tendency to fragment ourselves into us and them which some of it is manifesting these days during the pandemic, of course, because we're so threatened. And some of the conversations I've been having with Jamil had to do with what is the root of othering and how can we avoid prejudice? We actually bonded more than 10 years ago over an article he wrote called, Can the Aliens Reduce Prejudice for Us? I'm paraphrasing. Recently, he wrote another article in the Washington Times called Wartime Compassion. Fighting coronavirus feels like fighting a war that might bring us together. So it's really this idea that when we're threatened, there is an other. If the aliens came, which sounds a little bit hoaxy, but when we look at the social psychology of it, if we're threatened and there's an other, it gives us the opportunity to bind together in solidarity as a single race. This is really this idea in the Washington Post article 
that if we can begin to look at the virus as the other that we're all fighting, it invites us to come together as a human species in solidarity and find a sense of belonging in that particular community of care. When we approach it in this way, we begin to think who are our soldiers, who are our warriors? And I'm gonna be talking with you about supporting our troops, people that are working as healthcare providers, people bringing the packages, supporting them, appreciating them has to do with also being in solidarity with our own human group, finding more safeness and connection around that in a time of relative temporary disconnection for us. This is a brilliant perspective from Paul Gilbert. Social distancing, same thing, fragmenting. So you notice how I'm really emphasizing this theme of fragmentation and trying to bring it together instead. Paul said that social distancing is a disastrous term. I think I agree. Instead, we recommend safe relating. When I'm not meeting my parents or my grandparents in person and I Zoom them, I'm not social distancing from them. I'm safely relating. It really activates different parts of our brain. The intention is to be in contact with others, how to be in warm, caring contact with others, how to relate. So the task is to continuously focus on relating while we're having a challenging time because that's our emphasis. We need to be seen, heard, cared for, acknowledged, responded to, engaged. We also have the same need to do these things for others. It's a human innate capacity and need that we all harbor. We need to acknowledge others. So this is where I start coming at you with some pretty clear advice. When you go to the grocery store, acknowledge the person selling you groceries, nod, wave at people, express yourself. Make sure that you're consciously relating to people. Have people relate to you. Do that in a way that is very noticeable, even theatrical if you need to, if you're wearing a mask. Find these ways to acknowledge other people. This is part of our core humanity. Another important advice. We text a lot, too often in my opinion, even before the pandemic. We need exposure to voice tones, to facial expression. It's an evolutionary need. We're wired to relate in these ways. And again, this is not just about being nice or being polite. I want to wave this new edition of psychology today. I hope you can see it. And there's a brilliant article starting out here, face to face, talks about relating in a changed world. And, and, and it talks about, amongst other things, the need for social input. There's a very powerful statement for Dr. Emiliana Simon Thomas. She's the science director for the Greater Good Center. She's a neuroscientist. When he talks about social input, she says, if you don't have that input, the circuits and pathways and structures dedicated to that kind of processing will atrophy. Well, that's pretty scary. And again, my intention here is not to say scary things, but to help us be in contact with the reality is that being in contact with facial expression, with voice tone, choosing to Zoom, even if it's limited, and having that facial expression connection, that's really important. That actually keeps our humanity, keeps our brain functioning the way that it has been. You know, when I talk to my clients, I tell them, you've done a good job going to the grocery store, filling up the pantry of your kitchen. Let's fill up the pantry of our hearts as well. Or if you want to be more specific, you can talk about the pantries of our brain, activating the, the, these brain circuits. Some of the online programs that we're currently developing, rolling out, piloting really has to do with face-to-face, synchronous and asynchronous opportunity to be in contact with voice tone, to be in contact with, with facial expression. So I'm really encouraging you to do the same, even when it feels limited. Keep connected. So we're gonna talk a little bit about being with our experience as well, what is happening within us. So we have these different modalities. Where is my attention going? Where's my thinking or reasoning going? Kind of behaviors, emotions, motivations. So let's dive into that together. I want to offer up this opportunity to think about how to integrate these different experiences because we sometimes forget about them. One of the big complaints I hear from people these days, the days are blur, everything is monotonous, everything is the same. So this is an invitation to tap into something that I think in modern society we don't think about enough, which is our bottom-up experience, our nonverbal life. We start by looking at our senses, our sense of sight, touch, even as simple as just taking a pause to rub our index finger against our thumb, sense of smell, taste, auditory stimuli. I literally brought, this is the most prompt heavy 
the workshop I've ever done. I brought you a little cup of tea or coffee in the morning. You, you have your coffee. Before you have it, can you smell it a little bit? Really activating your olfactory bulb, noticing sensations that come with it. Essential oils are getting more and more research. That's interesting. Smelling lavender oil can be really powerful. Uh, Deborah Lee, who's a trauma specialist in compassion focused therapy, did really interesting work on, 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 on smell and lavender specifically. If you just Google lavender and anxiety, you're going to find a lot there. There's a way of bringing our sensory world online that is now getting integrated with our thinking process. The monotony has to do in part, we begin to shut down our attention circuits. Introception and proprioception, very fancy world, really inviting you to just attend to your internal body sensation, that is your introception. Now you might feel a lot, you don't want to experience that. How to fold that with care, almost like you're relating to a young child, how to hold and care the opportunity to be with your inner body experience. And then proprioception, what is my body posture right now? If I stretch here, I do this cactus arm situation. What is happening in my spine? How is that impacting my feelings, my mood? One of the most powerful books written lately is called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Barrett Feldman, really highlighting some of what I'm sharing here, that being in contact with our sensory world is helpful to identify emotional experiences. Dan Siegel is another powerful researcher and, 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 and thinker to orient there. Spending time in nature, if possible, we know it's become, becoming a little more easy now to go out walking in nature, really be in your environment, activate your sensory world. If you can do it with people you're already sheltering in place with, that's great. If you want to go on your own, as I do, that's fine. Uh, earthing is an interesting concept to be aware of. I think it's got very ancient roots, literally. Uh, if you just Google earthing and immunity, earthing inflammatory responses, you will find that there's some really cool research on just having your bare feet on the soil, on the surface of the earth. Something about the electrons of the surface of the earth, our body being in contact with the earth, we have better immunity. We have better recovery from wounds. There's one particularly gross article where you see pictures of wounds before and after with control groups, people just having their feet flat on the ground. So these are profound truths that on some level, our species has always been aware of. Be in contact with the earth, be in contact with nature, be in contact with your sensory world. Exercise, be in contact with your body. See if you can break a sweat a few times per week, uh, every day is great. Build in cardio and exercise as well as mental meditation practice into your daily routine. Most of the things I'm telling you are intuitively sensical. The trick is to actually build it into your scheduling. I'm reminded now, it's coming to me, one of my dear friends and mentors, uh, Dr. Joe Ruzak, who's a very important internet intervention person, a behavioral psychologist. He always tells me, you know, doing, knowing all these things is great. It's all about scheduling them. So as benign as it might seem, if you're inspired to pick up your planner, your scheduler, and now really plugging in some activities for yourself to do these things, that's where the rubber meets the road, beginning to actually schedule and create that structure for yourself. I've become myself enamored with the magic of YouTube yoga, which I've never done before. So I'm in my living room, you know, almost every day now, plugging in a YouTube and doing it in that way. So it's for each of us to find what works for them, but be in contact with, with your physical body, with your breath, as we will in, in, in a moment, as, as well as with your thinking mind. Internal imagery, seeing with your eyes closed, right? So I'm really trying to get us acquainted or get in contact with things we maybe not think about as much. Dan Siegel does a brilliant job of talking about this, as well as Paul Gilbert and the compassion model. You know, we can mentalize images in our minds, like having these internal movies. It's obvious that we've had trauma, these flashbacks just keeps coming, these intrusive, painful thoughts. Imagery work really goes, you know, past the cognition, below the, the thoughts. It really taps into something perhaps deeper or more direct in our experience. Importantly, we can also generate new soothing based emotional experiences by using imagery. So I'm also inviting you to bring awareness to your experiences of internal imagery. Really notice what it's like for you to identify imagery as they come to you. Be at peace with them. If they're a harsh, you can do just a little bit and come back as well as practice positive safety related imagery, connection with others. And I hope we'll have time to do some of that later today together. 
right? So our, our sensations, our imagery world, notice how much I've been able to say, but things are not verbal. They're not about our thoughts and our cognitions, right? So we tap into that first. We try to be with it the best we can. So we really want to integrate these different faculties, these modalities of experience that we all have. It can be oriented towards threat as it has been for many of us, just like I've read in that important comment before. And as we begin to move, towards recognizing what is happening for us, recognizing the programming at hand, recognizing that it can actually shift and be oriented towards compassion as well. So it's really the intention here to be in contact with our different modalities and to have them be integrated. We identify them separately and then we integrate them into one coherent experience. That's what it's about, being with our experience. Powerful comment here, where attention goes, neural firing flows, right? So this is really Dan Siegel suggesting, whenever we focus on our experience in, in this particular way, we become entrenched in that place. So if I'm focused on threat or anxiety or anger, I let my attention stay there, that's where I'm gonna get stuck. So beginning to find a way to gently notice and switch, notice and switch, and bring my attention to another place with, with breath work, sometimes distraction, sometimes other strategies, but recognizing if I keep my attention in one place too long, that's probably going to dictate my experience. My experience is a harsh one. This really would want to practice distress tolerance, right? So this idea of challenging, but not overwhelming. So I invite you to go inward, to be with your experience, to check in. I also acknowledge that sometimes it's hard. So do that to the extent that you can. Do that to the extent that you feel comfortable doing, and then come back for a break. If you're comfortable doing it for longer, that's fine. Judith Herman, I'm reminded now in her book, Trauma and Recovery, suggests how do we know that exposure is working? It's when the challenge, difficulty, trauma becomes boring to you. So it's not that all of us need exposure per se, but to be with our experience that is challenging when we're not triggered by it. So we can gently oscillate, pendulate, as Peter Levine says, between the challenge and rest, the challenge and rest and finding a way to feel safe in that process. Our cognitions, we're so oriented, especially during these times, towards shame, criticism, social comparison. This one bullet point here, actually, the videos I mentioned from Gilbert, there's an hour and a half talking only about that one bullet point, very powerful. One of the things that are memorable to me in watching that series of talks that Paul Gilbert just offered was the comment, don't be ashamed of your worry. It makes a lot of sense to worry. It's really activating these programs in your mind that are, that are feeling threatened. Challenge is we become reactive, we get agitated in our body and mind, and we're not responsive. So to see if you can shift from being reactive to being responsive, shift from feeling unsafe, which you still might feel unsafe, but holding that sense of fear and unsafeness with a sense of care, a sense of nurture, Say to yourself, it's understandable I'm thinking this way. I might replace the thought, I might accept the thought, but it's understandable it's coming up for me. We isolate ourselves when we think that, oh, I'm the only person thinking this way. Many of us are experiencing the world is unsafe right now. It just makes sense. Finding safety within, creating an internal secure base. I'll mention another model. I wanna be very integrative here. Internal family systems orienting to the different parts within. Uh, Richard Schwartz developed the model. I really enjoyed his perspective that our primary attachment relationship is with ourselves. So finding a secure base within is where we start intrapersonally, finding safety within, finding ground within. And then we strive to build connections with others. We're gonna talk more about how to do that. Orienting to our motivational focus, competition versus collaboration. That one is so important, it's getting its own slide. So this is the fundamental tension between competing and sharing and collaborating. Since the beginning of time, this evolutionary tension of competing for resources, sharing resources, striving to be above others, creating social comparison, creating self-criticism, uh, leading to more depression, more anxiety, has to do with leadership styles as well or switching over to a caring and collaboration type of mentality. So our attention can go towards competition or towards collaboration. If I'm starting to focus, oh, this person is writing a book during the, they're doing this, they're doing that. My thoughts are going there, I'm getting agitated in my body versus collaborating, oh, maybe I can reach out to them. Maybe I can have a nice conversation there. Maybe I can connect, maybe I can bond. Instead of being threatened by that individual, 
my whole physiology and mindset begin to shift. So the invitation is to shift from competition to collaboration. The dimensions of nurturance. Oh, of course, this quote is important. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. One of my favorite quotes. Right? So the intention here is for us to go far as a species and be of support to each other, activating our caring system, feeling safe together. Looking at caring and nurturance, awareness of the need to be nurturing, right? So we're gonna look through these dimensions. What needs to be nurturing? here? The motivation to nurture others. What is driving us to nurture others? What is happening to them? Understanding what is needed to be nurtured. Am I responding to the right thing? Expression of nurturing feelings or behavior with an ability to match forms of nurturing with needs. So we think about this example of, you know, the overbearing mother is always feeding the child. Does the child actually need or want to be fed in that way? Is there a match or a mismatch with the needs? And is there an ability to offer feedback? Are needs for nurturance on both sides and nurturing actually synergistic? So these are the dimensions of care and nurturance that we look at together in this model. How do we do that for ourselves? How do we take care of ourselves? Very important, right? So we also look at interpersonal processes, others to self, self to others. Another example of these three directions. The ability to regulate threat, the ability to begin to reduce threat starts with affiliation with oneself, experiences of a lovable self. Well, that really has to do with the experience. It's not just the cognition, like a thought, oh, I'm lovable. We experience as ourselves as held in care, as love. It has to do with internal representation of helpful others, and sources of comfort. It has to do with early memories. We know that early memories of soothing really support us in feeling cared for, feeling resilient and the ability to overcome trauma. And it has to do, of course, with impacting the way that our brains work. So our, our prefrontal cortex, very active as we develop these skills, our ability to notice, mindfully reflect, stress tolerance, approach our suffering as opposed to run away from it, reframing perspectives, and then again, that helps us in regulating our threat activity. Doing that with others, we can regulate threat through this access to others, later internal soothing, and you might be needing to do that through Zoom, might be needed to do that over the phone for a little while. It's safe to explore, to be in contact with others, the ability to develop that kind of social intelligence. And again, these mentalizing and empathy skills, whether it's towards ourselves or towards others, all this supports these relationships and, 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 and capacity for relationship building and pro-social behaviors, right? So really trying to figure out how to be safe, how to downregulate our threat system through connection with others. And we acknowledge that it doesn't always look this way. Maybe life was a bit hard with attachment and trauma, or maybe we're just feeling like we're not getting a lot of external feedback these days. Many of us are in the home and we're hungry for this positive social feedback and in lieu of that feedback, we begin to tell us our stories. Oh, this person doesn't want to talk to me. We haven't been in touch for a while. I don't have memories of connection. Those are fading. I'm really focusing on this, this threat that I'm experiencing. And that impacts the way our brains are working. We might go into a place of depression, anxiety. So we want to keep these connections alive. We also want to recognize to begin to rec regulate these, these difficult stressors. We want to look at the body. So first and foremost, we regulate our physical experience, our somatic experience. So we look at our parasympathetic system and our sympathetic system, we recognize that our vagus nerve is quite active there in down-regulating our, 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 our heartbeat, the speed of our sympathetic system, this go, 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 and, and beginning to shift over to our parasympathetic system. I'm gonna offer a short practice in a moment. And before I do, I want to tell you a little, a little fact that's really interesting about our breath. When we inhale, we activate our sympathetic nervous system. This go, go, go has to do with drive, has to do with anxiety and nervousness. When we exhale, we activate our parasympathetic system, our ability to feel safe, soothed in our body and mind. So we're going to work with that, that little truth about our breath. So let's, let's take a moment here to kind of ground ourselves, shifting away from the intellect. And we can go into a little practice. I'm going to invite you to come back home, come back into the body. If you wish, you may close your eyes or lower your gaze. 
Just be in contact with your body, with your breath. Begin to draw breath through your nostrils. Cool on the inhale, warmer on the exhale. See if you can draw breath into your belly, into your diaphragm area, belly soft. Almost like you just had a big meal and the meal is just air. Just allow a natural rhythm of breath to emerge. And on your next exhale, I invite you to say to yourself internally, body slowing down. And on the inhale that follows, mind slowing down. Again, belly rising and falling, noticing contact points with the chair, the ground, the couch, wherever you might be. Noticing the experience of being in contact. And on the next exhale, body slowing down. The following one, mind slowing down. Just allow yourself to be with the rhythm of your breath without trying to change anything. Noticing your sensation, your heartbeat. Recognizing we can always be in contact with our body and breath. Beginning to come back into the room you're in, beginning to orient our environment. Keeping in contact with our body and breath. Coming back into our shared space here. I'm gonna offer up three general responses to meditation because we don't always react the same. You know, some of us are gonna respond by saying, I'm feeling focused, mindful, alert, safe, engaged. Right? That's kind of what many of us are hoping for when we practice mindfulness or any kind of awareness practice. Uh, some of us even talk about experiencing non-dual spiritual connection. My recent favorite expression for that is in a book called The Finders, uh, written by a neuroscientist looking at fundamental well-being across populations. And it was talking about this experience of the universe looking at the world through my eyes. Wow. Well, many of us, probably most of us, don't have that as a daily experience, and that's okay. We practice just to feel a bit more focused, safe grounded. And, and if that happens, that's great. And I want to acknowledge maybe it doesn't happen. Some of us are just going to get kind of sleepy or fatigued or drowsy. And that's okay too. That's part of the practice. And, and the fact that we feel calm or safe enough to go into that space, that too is something to celebrate. It's an opportunity to find restfulness, even if we haven't arrived at that attuned place of clarity that we often strive towards. And I'll name a third one that is also a common experience for many of us. Agitated, restless, distracted, angry, anxious, triggered. That one is also true. When we go inward, we learn how to be with our experience. And when that happens, that unfolds for us. There are some challenges that emerge as well. So I want to name that. And that's the opportunity to practice this trust tolerance, to really be with what emerges for us without judgment. And, and that might be for 20 or 30 seconds, then coming back into the room, a little bit more coming back into the room. So I just want to name these three general responses. There's probably others, but these kind of capture what we're experiencing and to have a sense of okayness and acceptance about whatever emerges there. Talk a little bit about our emotional systems that are obviously quite important. We have our threat system. We have our drive system and our soothing system that we talk about in compassion mind training. And here they are visually represented. Our threat system has to do with anger, anxiety, sadness, disgust, aversion, wanting to keep safe. And let's start with that one. We'll dive into the others. For instance, we have this little guy here is just trying to keep safe, right? And then we have other experiences. So us humans, we want to have enough to eat. We don't want to get our head busted open. But if we think about child soldiers, we think about gangs. Notice we don't see the people's skin color here. We assume gangs are going to be a particular skin color. Not too long ago, they looked like this. And that activate threat activity, right, for us. 
rejection, a sense of being excluded. 10,000 years ago, you're pushed away from your group. Guess what? You might die. So being excluded in group, out group, and so forth is something that uh, can be extraordinarily dangerous for us in activating our threat system. We fail a test when we're kids, we're feeling excluded, you're a loser. Notice the in-group, out-group tension continuously threaded here. At work, we're excluded because we're threatened, we might not be able to keep our job, we get burnt out. And of course, now at home, we're feeling another, a novel kind of threat, if you will, a really tricky kind of threat. Very, very dangerous and complicated realities to be in for us. We're just home and we're again, our threat system is activated. And if we think about our, our heroes, our frontline uh, soldiers of compassion, if you will, I've had the honor of working with lots of nurses dealing with stress and burnout. It's always been stressful. And of course, these days it's extra stressful. So the invitation is noticing those who are getting their threat system activated, fighting this war on our behalf, keeping us safe, and also acknowledging the other warriors, those frontline uh, soldiers of care and compassion, bringing us food, selling us groceries. What can we do to acknowledge them? How can we appreciate them? This is not just about them, it's also about us aligning behind fighting this war against the virus, being in solidarity with our species as a whole, finding connection in that group of connection and belonging. Our drive system, we win the lottery, that gets exciting. We graduate, that gets exciting. Right, so this go, go, go sense of enthusiasm. Then we begin to have that mix of threat and drive. And again, people working in healthcare safely, quickly, safely, quickly, safely, quickly. Again, you're seeing that mixture of threat and drive. We acknowledge that. So for many of us, this is the reality. You know, a lot of threat, a little bit of drive that's really fed by our, our threat system. And it's just a tiny, tiny bit of soothing. So the intention here is really finding a way to begin to find a path to be responsive to our threat system through safeness and soothing. So I mentioned here our soothing system, the ability to feel safely connected and cared for, caring for others. This slide about the turtles, I'm gonna go fast here. Ain't nobody else got the turtles back, but really what that means is that if you're a reptilian, you're not gonna have really good chances of survival. Most of them, there's actually lower than two or three percent. So you just don't have the heart to, to talk about how many turtles don't make it to adulthood, that's what happens when you don't have an attachment system. We humans are lucky to have such high survival rates because we have an active soothing system. We have the ability to nurture our young. I miss doing this in person where you see people's faces going kind of smooshy smoosh when we go through these images of affiliated bonds. This is really about our soothing system. This is really about activating capacity for care and nurturance in our soothing system. We're also recognizing that now with shelter in place, we might be needing to soothe each other. And that's important. So if we're at the home with our loved ones, some of us get along really well, some of us do not, sometimes less so. I hear about it from my therapy clients. What can we do to support each other in feeling soothed? Recognize it's understandable your threat system is so active here. I'll share an acronym by Dan Gilbert, it's super helpful, it's called PART. Presence, attunement, resonance, trust. How to be in relationship with others. Presence, how to be open to possibilities unfolding. Attunement, really paying attention to what the other person is going through. Resonance, experiencing some of that with them. Trust emerges from that kind of interaction, from that kind of dynamic. So that's a really important thing to be able to be doing with our, our loved ones at home these days and all days really. We're alone, going out in nature is really important, really helpful, I encourage you to do that the best you can, being in contact with your environment, activating our senses, and of course, being in contact with people best we can. Is it ideal? No. Is it important? Yes. Does it keep us alive in terms of our humanity continuing to pulsate and be in contact with? Absolutely. So that's really talking about our soothing and again, our healthcare workers, notice what they did here. They put their faces, so bringing the facial expression or facial, facial presence into contact, no matter what, being in teams this way. And again, the ability to appreciate those who are working for us these days to keep us safe while most of us are kind of sheltering in place, staying at home. So again, that appreciation is both psychological and ideological. It helps us feel a sense of belonging. It also helps us kind of recognize that as we are feeling safe, we are one race, we are one species fighting this invisible enemy. It's a rare opportunity 
to other something that is not a human group, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be something lovely to strive towards? That would increase our well-being as well, we know that. So again, we strive to create that kind of balance, if you will. I'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly because I wanna kind of make it to the top of the hour and, and thank those who need to leave us at the top of the hour and then we're gonna do a little bit more practice together as well. So I'm just gonna name the fears of compassion scale that I encourage you to look up. And the fears of compassion really has to do with relationships with giving and receiving care and fears about giving and receiving care. So we see that when we're afraid of extending care or afraid of receiving care or showing it to ourselves, we have more stress, more depression, and more anxiety. The reason I have these numbers here is really to name how, you can see my mouse hovering here, how close these numbers are. We assume that self-care, self-compassion is gonna give us the best well-being. Actually, the ability to receive care and nurture from others is equally important. When you're a baby, one day old, your core skill is receiving care and nurturance from others. So what can we do to be active in these three directions? That's the invitation to recognize that we need to become less afraid of giving and receiving care from others. I'm not gonna go through the specifics just because I wanna make it to the top of the hour, but I do wanna invite you to print out, and I even did it here, a little show and tell. I printed out my own fears of compassion scales because I wanna invite you to do the same. I'm just gonna have these slides up. I'm not gonna narrate them just because of time. And I wanna invite you to print it out and to begin to journal, to log for yourself. What are the different things that are going to help you in being able to be in contact with others, you know, letting people come close, being scared they might get to know you a little bit. That's scary because if you knew me, you would leave me or the only way I can get anything done is by being self-critical. That's factually not true, but we believe these things. We're afraid of relating to ourselves and others differently. And again, that leads to more stress, depression, anxiety. So I invite you to kind of work with that scale and learn what, what that can do for you, what that means for you, right? So, so this is a concrete activity that you can do during this time, just print out that scale and begin to prompt yourself to engage others, whether Zoom, even text if you don't wanna do Zoom, talking with others, keeping connected during this time. Don't kind of shrivel into disconnect from others. That is the key. I'm gonna share with you uh, this story, which I feel deeply moved by. It's an ancient Native American story. Uh, it talks about the different parts that operate within us. One evening, a grandfather was teaching his young grandson about the internal battle that each person faces. There are two wolves struggling inside each of us, the old man said. One wolf is vengeful, angry, resentful, self-pitying, and scared. The other wolf is compassionate, faithful, hopeful, and caring. Grandson sat down thinking, then asked, which wolf wins, grandfather? Grandfather replied, the one you feed. So we have these operating forces within us. There are different parts and sub-personalities such as our angry, sad, or anxious self. In a way, it doesn't make sense to ask you, what were you thinking yesterday? What were you feeling yesterday? Because actually you had multiple perspectives you have multiple experiences within. You're not a monolithic creature because your angry self has one set of thoughts, one set of behavior they want to engage with motivation. Your sad self kind of want to shrivel away. Your anxious self might be feeling freaked out, having other thoughts. So these different parts are having different thoughts and different behavior that they're aligned with that are rooted in our threat system. The invitation with CFT is striving to cultivate the compassionate self-identity, which is really active in, in all these directions, right? In all these, these three directions, extending to others, receiving from others, and self-compassion. So it's this invitation to cultivate in other parts of us that's really rooted in our soothing system of care and nurturance. This identity has particular attributes which support us in dealing with life's challenges. So I'm gonna name these attributes together. I just wanna give you a moment to kind of take that in. 
We're not monolithic creatures. There's different parts within us that we can cultivate. There's different wolves, so to speak, that we can feed. There's probably more than two wolves, by the way, right? So what part are we encouraging us to, to, to cultivate? Our compassionate self-identity is rooted in these three attribute clusters. The first has to do with a sense of strength, stability, and groundedness in the body and mind. So that's really about the ability to be with our experience, practice breath awareness, shifting from our sympathetic system to our parasympathetic system. Wisdom, the deep sense of understanding about suffering, our threat system and our tricky brains, right? So this deep ability to be understanding of unfolding there, to be able to be grounded in our physiology and observe with a vista point of understanding towards the reality that is unfolding for us. I understand you're, you're, you're behaving in a way that's a bit challenging right now. I think you're trying to keep safe. Your threat system is quite active right now. How can I help you in feeling a bit more safe? I'm supported by my strong commitment and motivation to care in these three directions. So these attributes of strength, wisdom, and a strong commitment for care and nurturance. Now we can play in different ways with these attributes. We'll do a practice soon. We can also have mental exercises. I really like Steve Hayes who developed ACT. He put up a blog a few months ago about making good decisions. And I think it also fits for cultivating attributes. So the idea is for instance, if your sense of strength and stability was a movie, what would that be? If your sense of wisdom and understanding was represented through a song, or through a theater play, what would the song be? What would the theater play be, right? So it's really enriching our way of having a frame of reference towards these mental faculties. If your strong commitment and motivation to care in these three directions was a body gesture, what would that body gesture be, right? How would that be represented? How would you move your body to represent this? So Steve Hayes was writing about how to make good decisions and how to represent these decisions in creative, artistic, physio physiological, or somatic ways, I think we can use it for the attributes as well. So that's a clever way of thinking about how to cultivate these attributes. And we will do more of this cultivation. We will do more, uh, more practice together as well. And I'm noticing we're at the top of the hour. These are the core teachings and perspective that I was hoping to offer up. We're gonna go on for longer for probably another 20, probably 30 minutes. Uh, when you do more practice, responding to some questions and comments, but if you need to leave at the top of the hour, thank you so much for, for joining us. Really appreciate you being with us. And I'm kind of hoping secretly, well, not secretly, because I'm saying it out loud. I'm hoping that most of you will choose to stay with us if you're able to. So we're going to dive further and go into discussion, and then we'll do some practice together as well. All right, so I'm going to pop in the Q&A here and see what we got. Here. Okay, how do you practice attention training by shifting your attention without suppressing, ignoring the thought or emotion that come up? Absolutely, and, and the intention of attention training is, you know, it started with just observation. So we're not really trying to suppress or push away anything. There are many ways to do attention training. If you have a really active mind that's only firing, maybe your job is not to just notice the breath or notice an object. Maybe being with the thoughts, the way to understand, okay, these thoughts are not who I am, these thoughts do not comprise you know, my, my sense of being as, as a person, maybe I can just observe them. I really like the leaves of, on a stream exercise where I visualize my thoughts just floating on a stream. So my attention training is really about a sense of peacefulness as I observe my experience, as I observe what is unfolding for me there, rather than trying to move away from it. As I do that enough, and I allow my attention to follow what is most present and alive in me, that becomes an exercise in distress tolerance and emotion regulation as well. You start slowly to have more and more mastery over your attention coming and going as well. Let's scroll down, look at the... Absolutely, there's a comment here. There will be a trigger, then the dialogue, will go back in time, right? So it's really about the relationship with the trigger. It's really about the relationship with the trigger. Thank you, that was lovely. Well, I guess that's not a 
question. Uh, here's another comment, I think. We feel pushed off the fence or bullied by extreme. Uh, and that one is a little bit political, which I think actually makes good sense, but I'm gonna keep this focus on the human experience rather than politics, but I, I hear you. I, I don't necessarily uh, see things differently. Um, we will be able to come back to this and view recorded version, absolutely be able to view the recorded version. Okay, is it wise to keep attempting to meditate if anxiety increases or perhaps it is good to practice or better to practice taking uh, a, a, a beat or when attention training comes in. So I'm gonna interpret what that means for me when I, when I read this is yes, it's good to, to practice when we're having a, a, a challenging time, we're feeling triggered. And again, the intention of, of being with practice here is again, this, this message of, of challenging but not overwhelming. If I think about some of the individuals that I have the honor of working with, people that are dealing with trauma, it's definitely good to practice kind of moving inward and being with our experience. And at the same time, we want to do that for a little bit, maybe not closing the eyes, maybe doing it for 20 or 30 seconds, or even if it's us and we're feeling a lot of threat, how to move inward in a way that supports us in feeling safe and feeling grounded. We're going we're gonna to take more questions and comments. I, I encourage you to, to keep them coming. If you're offering a question, it's helpful to me if it can be kind of a briefer question so I can kind of quickly look at it and then offer a response. Um, and I want to offer up another practice, and I'm actually going to do what I preached and have a little bit of tea and smell it too. And this is the, uh, we're going to practice this combination of uh, safe place practice uh, and then cultivating our, our compassionate self-identity that you see here on the screen. So again, I invite you to come back home, come back into the body, noticing our posture, noticing Our ability to be with our experience, our backs up, a sense of dignity, chin up, so we're both relaxed and alert. Beginning to bring awareness to the breath, coming in through the nostrils, cool on the inhale, warmer on the exhale. Noticing the rise and fall of our abdomen, belly soft, just being with our breath. You want to keep your eyes closed, that's good. If you want to lower your gaze, whatever feels comfortable, just being with the rhythm of the breath. And in your mind's eye, I invite you to begin to mentalize and visualize yourself in a place where you feel safe, soothed, supported. It might be a place like a river bank or a mountain top or sitting in a forest clearing, maybe the rooftop of a building. Whatever place feels safe, soothing, comforting for you this time. And just continuing to be with the experience that unfolds for you. Continuing to cultivate this imagery of the safe place you're in. Noticing the texture of your experience. Some of you will get a really clear image. Some of you will get a hazy kind of image. Both are good. It's really about the intention, training our minds, faculties to create that safe place imagery for us. Noticing our imagery is influenced by sounds of the music. 
by the beat of your own heart, by your own sensations. And just focus on yourself being in that safe place. Noticing contact with the breeze against your skin, the rustling of leaves, taking in breath, cool on the inhale, warmer on the exhale, belly rising and falling. Just noticing the sense of smell. What are some smells in your safe place that feel soothing and nurturing to you? Noticing a sense of feeling welcomed. This notion of belonging, this safe place is, is happy to see you, happy to have you there. It's being in your environment, feeling safe and connected. Noticing what arises for you as you really be with presence, be with this experience. And as you become more safely grounded and situated within your safe place here, Begin to orient to the quality of your being as you sit in this safe place. Notice your posture. See if you can really bring awareness to a posture, sitting up with a sense of strength and stability. Sense of dignity in your posture. Sitting in our safe place as if we're a tall, stable mountain, just embodying that kind of physical, somatic experience here. Really noticing strength in our body. If there's still edge, there's still nervousness or anxiety, that's okay. Strong enough to hold it. We just pay attention to it with nurturance as if we would relate to a young child. And we build on these qualities of strength and stability. We focus on our sense of wisdom. We embody our passion and self-identity, our safe place. Noticing our ability to be understanding caring, nurturing towards ourselves. If there's any parts that feel tension or holding, if you can extend a sense of warmth, a sense of care, well, if your mind wanders to other things, that's okay, that's what minds do. Make use of our wisdom. Just bring back awareness into our body, into our safe place experience, supported by our strength and our wisdom. We notice our third quality of commitment. As we sense ourselves in this environment, smell the smells, we experience those internal visuals, our safe place. We notice our commitment for care and nurturance. Yes, there is hardship. Yes, there is difficulty. And we feel committed to be in relationship with suffering, our own or others, the sense of sensitivity, the willingness to really be present with whatever arises without changing, without judging, just responding with a sense of nurturance, being with our breath, just orienting to our experience as a whole, just noticing ourselves. 
embodying our compassion and self-identity rooted in strength, wisdom, commitment for care, really focusing on our compassion and self-image here, being in our safe place environment, feeling rooted, grounded, connected with ourselves, feeling willingness to engage others, being with our breath. And we recognize that we can always come back home to our body and breath. We recognize that our safe haven is always present for us within and can be extended between as well. As we remind ourselves of these truths, we invite ourselves to gently and slowly bring our awareness, bring our attention back into the space we are in, joining us here. Gently opening your eyes when you're ready. And again, as we come back into sharing space together in the room, again, echoing this proposition that capacity to be in contact with body and breath, the capacity to be in contact with internal imagery, with our own sense of identity, that is forever present. Yes, there are different parts. Yes, our threat system is powerful. And, but there are ways to reduce the intensity. There are ways to downregulate our body's sympathetic nervous system, to downregulate the, the, the harshness that comes with feeling so much threat, to come back into safety and to begin to notice that, you know, and switch to another way of being, to another quality of experience that again is rooted in those attributes. Some people talk about Tara Brock, I think talks about the, the future self, this part of me that's growing a bit more old and wise and regulated and knows how to observe the experience. That's another way we would kind of look at this, our wise self, our future self. In CFT, we talk about our compassion and self-identity. Since the beginning of time, our species and ancient tradition have been talking about these multiple parts. So it's recognizing parts are rooted in threat, parts are rooted in soothing, safeness, and nurturance. So really felt important to echo these perspectives, both cognitively and intellectually, but also through practice, noticing what it's like to feel that in the body, we're able to orient into these experiences. Let's go back into our chat box here, go to our Q&A, lots of questions. Would you be willing to provide us with a list of books and authors you mentioned during the training? Sure, I'm happy to tell you about some of my favorite thinkers. Uh, absolutely. Um, I feel moved to tell you about another favorite thinker of mine. I think I mentioned him before, Dr. Ronnie Berger is a, you know, been a mentor and friend over the years. Uh, and he talks about continuity. So really when we look at terror management theory and some of these, these difficulties that are happening for us, part of it is our belief that our lives will be discontinued. So part of the challenge for us is we're having a hard time this is perfect. I'm looking at a comment right now that says, what will happen to us? I wasn't even planning for that. What will happen to us, right? So, so that, that's a really deep one, this fear of what will happen to us. So part of our terror here is we can't see the future. This is one of Ronnie's big thing working as a trauma specialist is supporting people in planning for a future horizon. Myself, I'm super excited to go to Costa Rica. When? I don't know. But building in hope, Building in the opportunity to consider that our lives will, will, will go on is very, very important during these times. Absolutely. What to do when it when it feeling for own privilege and in, in, in compassion to others? I'm gonna kind of explain why I think that means to me. Uh, what if I'm doing relatively okay and others are doing much worse? What can I do with my own guilt? Well, again, I, I think that it's so much better to feel guilt than to feel shame. And, and, and Paul has a really beautiful set of talks about this. We want to shift over from shame of self-criticism towards guilt 
which really leads us towards action. If I'm feeling guilty with my privilege, maybe it's an invitation for me to take action. It can be as small as expressing verbal and, 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 and gestures of appreciation to people on the street that are perhaps less fortunate. Uh, you might enjoy giving. I, I personally like having a lot of $1 bills where I just kind of give it to people that, that, that need that. So I, I, I give a lot of $1 bills uh, or maybe more if you're, you have the means to do that, that's fabulous. Uh, maybe you can donate or just expressing appreciation to, to people around you. That, that's really important. Uh, taking action. It really doesn't matter what the action is as long as it's pro-social. And if you're feeling that privilege, these, these are things that, that you can do. How long does a change in interpersonal reactions to stress usually take and how can one focus inward on a daily? Well, that you know probably yields one of the most popular answers in psychology. It depends. I think that with practice, you can make that, that, that change in reactivity much, much smaller, much, much quicker. Um, it leads me to share one of my favorite quotes by, by Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose. In that choice lies our growth and our freedom. So when we get triggered through these reactivity moments, the problem is that it happens really fast. We don't have the time to actually change things within our experience. And then we get stuck in that triggered response that can go on for a very, very long time. It's interesting when we actually make space between stimulus and response, when we slow down the stimulus and our reaction to it, what unfolds is our ability to cultivate groundedness, to have more, more, more freedom, more growth, to to choose who we wish to be in the world. So, so really the idea of interpersonal reactivity and how to come back to it quicker has to do with slowing down initially the way we're responding to it, really being able to mindfully observe the programming of our own mind, really being able to, to be with our experience there. And again, how to practice on the daily. Uh, yeah, it's helpful if you can do a meditation practice, where you are able to really go inwards and spend 10, 20, 30 minutes, whatever is feasible for you uh, and make that your practice. And, and for some people, it's hard. It doesn't always show up easily. Uh, it doesn't always show up quickly. The idea of grief practices is very important because again, the idea is to come back home into our body and mind, to come back into our experience to me, uh, five seconds of mulling over your, your, your index thumb against, against uh, your index finger against your thumb, that's a brief practice. Having a little smooth stone that enjoy touching and, and reminding you to come back into presence, that's a practice. Taking a breath where you're orienting towards yourself, you to, towards a sense of smell, your olfactory bulb, that, that, that's a practice right there. So there, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to practice informally. Working with music, auditory, how is that impacting my experience as a whole? I really love the way Tara Brack talks about the dance of sensations, right? Our various bodily sensations which I've described and then how to integrate them in synergy with our thinking mind as well. So, so much of it has to do with our experience and then the ability to be present with the experience of others, absolutely. I wanna share with you, um, let me just, Click over here, I have a couple more slides I wanna share. This, is, this story really hit me in a huge way. I came across it a few months ago, how Huin Ekako, the very famous Zen teacher from Japan, and um, he's famous for the, the, the legendary koan, what is the sound of one hand clapping? So you can grapple with that one if you want, figure out that sound. And there's a story about him when he was older, probably in the mid 1700s, in Japan, and I'm going to tell you the story the way it was told to me. Uh, Kui Nekaku at that time was a very revered uh, Zen teacher, one of the famous ones in Japan. He was kind of living on the mountaintop, and he had lots of students that would flock to study with him. And I think he had a he had a good ride. Life was good as a Zen teacher. And one day, the farmer's daughter came to her parents and told them. Um, Oh yeah, I got some news, I'm pregnant. And they were, what? You're a teenager, you're 15. How could this be? How could you be pregnant? Who's the father? Well, they're completely freaking out. And she said, is the Zen teacher. 
they were livid, they were outraged. They spread the rumor, they spoke to the heads of the county, the, the rumor spread, the students stopped coming. One day they, they storm up the mountain, they tell him, how dare you do this? She, she's just a child, this is completely inappropriate. Um, she's pregnant because of you. And a queen looks at the parents, he looks at the teenager and he says to them, is that so? And they become even more angered and they leave. Months go by, she gives birth to the baby boy. And they realize that they don't have the means. They're too poor to take care of the baby. And again, they're very angry at Akuin, the Zen teacher. And they storm up the mountain. And they tell him, this is all your fault. You did this. Here's the baby. It's your responsibility. You need to take care of this baby. Um, and he looks at them. And he takes the baby gently in his arms. And he says to them, is that so? And they leave and he stays with the baby and he lovingly takes care of the baby and nurtures the baby over the course of a year. He's got no students. There's no social connection, social distancing, if you will. He's lost his status. And all he has is this baby that he nurtures and loves as if it was his own. As the year goes by, when he takes care of the baby, the daughter is very distraught. She comes to her parents and says to them, I can't take this anymore. I lied to you. It was not the Zen teacher. It was the butcher's son. Parents are so embarrassed. They're, they're just don't know what to do with themselves. They're, 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 they storm up the well, not so much storming up the mountain this time. They're walking up with shame, walking up the mountain. Arriving at the, at, the, at the top of the mountain, a queen is there taking care of the baby. There's no one there for a long, long time. And they say to him, we're so sorry. We were wrong. It's not your baby. And he looks at them and he smiles and he says, is that so? And he says, I'm glad you found the baby's father. And he hands them the baby and they take care of the baby. They take the baby with them. And ever so slowly, the students begin to come back. And that story is said to be a real story in his life. And life continues. And we're talking about a couple of years of this stuff of uh, being completely socially distanced, of taking care of the butcher's son in the middle of the night, of being agitated in a variety of ways and always coming back to ground. And we will never know what was going on in the minds of Akui and Ekako. But I think that it's safe to assume that there were some thoughts of the unpleasant variety as well. And to me, that's become a little bit of an inspiration about how to be with our experience, how to be with our mind where it's playing these tricks on us, how to be able to say, is that so? How to come back to ground, how to notice my agitated, threat face mind where I'm feeling unsafe and then gently return myself into a sense of safeness and connection. So that's a little bit about this idea. I wanted to offer up another kind of inspiration. You can find this here. Is that so story? There's lots of variations of that. So really this is a lot of what this work is about. We think about compassion. It's recognizing the programming within our mind, recognizing a lot of it is coming out of our threat systems and then orienting back into a sense of safeness and connection within ourselves and others, finding ground in that kind of way, and then cultivating that sense of identity, that other type of identity. And if the wording doesn't click for you, I encourage you to find your own. Compassionate self-identity is what we use. You can come up with your own sense of being in contact with an identity that is rooted in strength and wisdom and commitment for care, right? Cultivate, have that part be nourished and kind of sprout that part from within yourself. Some suggestions, things you can do concretely because of watching this webinar. List three things that you imagine yourself doing differently because of attending this webinar. So I have all these ideas to share. At the end of the day, I'm a behaviorist. I'm excited about people engaging in life in a way that is more helpful and nourishing. So I encourage you to find out what these things might be. This could be an internal shift in attitude towards yourself and others. It could be a concrete behavioral shift in the form of a chosen daily practice of activity. 
So if you want to do something after we wrap up here, just jot down a few bullet points, things you would do differently because of attending today. What are these three things? What will be the first step towards embodying and integrating each of these things into your life? Are you willing to commit to taking this first step? Last portion, if you were to integrate these things into your life, how do you imagine this might prove meaningful and helpful to you and those around you? So really reflecting about how that might be helpful to you. And we got just a couple of minutes and I think I'm gonna wrap up with just one more short practice. Again, I invite you to come back home into your body and breath. Moving away from specifics. Just orient to the last hour and a half what this webinar has meant for you. And just see if you can notice one thing in particular that really stood out to you. That really meant something to you that you find helpful. And just orient to that insight, perspective, conclusion. And if that insight, perspective, conclusion was to manifest as a concrete presence, as a concrete behavior you would integrate into your life this weekend, what would that look like? If you were to transform this insight into a behavior, how would that be meaningful and helpful to you and those around you? How would that influence your weekend? How would that influence your days moving forward? I leave you with these thoughts, perspectives, and experiences. I'm deeply grateful to you for the opportunity to spend this time together. Thank you so much. We appreciate being with you. And we hope you will tune into our research page at Palo Alto University because you will find more wonderful, helpful resources on that page as we brave these complicated realities. Thank you so much and be well.